Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vineyardchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. morning. How are you? We are in a series, part three of a three-part series, brand new. It's a brand new series called Brand New. The idea was when we start a new year, 2017, sometimes we want something new. You know, we call them New Year's resolutions and, and we, yeah, I could use a fresh coat of paint on this thing. You know, we want something new, but Often we don't get what we want. You know, I mean, 80%, over 80% of the people who, who make res resolutions by, by Valentine's Day, they've given up on them because they realize they don't work. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're like already starting to realize, wow, this resolution. A lot of people don't even make resolutions anymore. They just, they kind of gave up on that. They realize that's not, it doesn't work. And the reason is because in the New Year's, this, this resolution dilemma, when we try to put external things on us, it just doesn't work like that. God didn't design us that way. He designed us to be changed from the inside. And we've been looking at that. Kind of our theme verse has been this verse. If you pull out your outlines, you can follow along. The theme verse is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. says when somebody, when someone becomes a Christian. And if you pause there, you know, it's not, it doesn't mean that you go to church. It doesn't mean you're a good boy or a good girl. What does it mean when somebody becomes a Christian? Do they just, be, they start becoming more moral do they get religious? Do they get baptized? No. What he says is when somebody becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person on the inside. On the inside, he is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. And so that's what we've been talking about with this brand new series. Week one, we talked about beginning a new spiritual journey from the inside. And then at the end of each message, including this today's, we always end with some questions you can ask yourself. So if you missed that message, I encourage you to go on vineyardchurch.com and watch that. Look at those questions. Maybe you have your, your outline. Don't, don't just throw that out. That should be your questions you ask yourself throughout the year and say, you know what? I want to have my, my spiritual journey really be transformed this year. Because here's the deal. If, if, it's, if 2017 is the best year of your life spiritually, it will be the best year of your life. Because God will bless all these other areas. So you just make them, you know, God, I want you, you know, first place in my life. Then we looked at week two last week about, be, about new, so it was new faith and then new fitness. That God cares about our physical body. And that this, he calls this our sanctuary. A lot of times we call, you know, the room we meet in our sanctuary. People take their hats off and give it reverence and respect. But they don't really care about their body very much. But the Bible says that that actually is not the way it is. That this is just an auditorium. That there's auditoriums, no matter what people call them, the New Testament says the sanctuary is the body, your body, and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Dwells in you, not in some room, dwells in you. So we're to take care of our body. We talked about that, asked some questions about what that might look like. Today we're talking about new finances, because finances, what, what, you'll learn, what we look at today when we look at the Bible, we'll see that, that money is spiritual. Money is spiritual. It's not neutral. In fact, money has a spirit on it. Jesus talks about this. In fact, Jesus talks more about finances and money than he does about faith, more, he, more than, than he does about heaven and hell. He, I mean, it's all over because it's money is spiritual and it impacts us and influences us. We can be its victim in a negative way if we're not aware of the schemes of the spirit that can fall on money. So, we're going to look at that today so that we have, a, uh, we have victory in 2017 and beyond. Most people's problems are associated with money. If you look at statistics about the murders and deaths in, in America, a lot of it's over money, drug dealing, whatever it is, it's over money. Most divorces, people report, are connected to disputes over money, disputes over finances. And it can wreak havoc in your life, life if you're not, if, if you're not aware of that, there's actually a spirit that is upon money. Now, Jesus says, 
Notice with me on, on, in Luke 16. He's a, a number of verses, but we're going to look at this one. He says, and I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. Now, this is one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. What does that mean, unrighteous mammon? Well, he's talking about the spirit over money. He says, make friends for yourself. In other words, you take this world spirit on money, you put God's spirit on money, and then you use it to influence people. Then he says, then, then when you fail, that when you fail, why would, you know, who wants to fail? You know, why would I do that? I don't want to fail. Well, that's probably not the best translation. A better translation would be when you die, when you die. And you see that in others, many of the translations will say that, but, you know, when you die, meaning you take this, this world, the, the money that is the world spirit on it, you put God's spirit on it, you influence people for good so that when you die, they may receive you into an everlasting home. In other words, there's going to be a homecoming. You will influence people that you don't even know that you're influencing them. But when you go to heaven, they're going to come up to you and say, thank you, because you invested in a missionary that went to Mazalan, Mexico. I'm from Mexico. I was one of those kids that was influenced. I came to Christ. Here I am in heaven, and it's because of you. Or many other ways that it happens. But that's what Jesus is talking about. He's saying we can use the resources God gives us and there's a, we take the world's resources, we make it, we put God's blessing on it, we influence people, and it's going to influence people for eternity. Going on, Jesus says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Therefore, if you are one of those people who have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust True riches, true riches. We'll talk about that at the end of the message. And if you have not been faithful in what what in, in is another man's, who would give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters. Does it grab this? Jesus is saying that you have to choose. That money is not neutral. There's, there's one or the other. He says no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, I highlighted the word mammon because that's a transliteration of the original Greek word, mamonos. It, the reason why it's translated mammon is because there's no one English word that really gets it. Some translations say riches or wealth or money, but really that's inaccurate. Now, if they capitalize it, some of them capitalize it, money, then, then they're getting to it because it's, it's a proper noun. It's not an object. And so it's, it, it, it's, a, it's really mammon is the spirit. It's a Syrian god. It's the spirit of money. It's this, it was the Syrian god of money. And the, and the, the spiritual emphasis is that the god of mammon tries to influence you and control you through money. So you have to be aware of that. I'm trying, there's an entity, there's a force trying to control me, my decisions, my feelings, my emotions, all those things. And there's an entity trying to control me through money. This is unrighteous man. And there's this spirit over it that Jesus is talking about that rests on it. And you see it all over the world. You see people making decisions that are harmful to others, sometimes harmful to themselves, and destructive to themselves, destructive to their families because of this, this, this spirit. And you got to know that the spirit of mammon, is, it's, a, it's a god of mammon, a god of money, and it's, it tries to promise us what only God really can give us. And, there's, and it controls us through fear. Well, that's one of the ways that the, the spirit of mammon controls us, the sp is, is fear, fear that we'll never have enough. You'll never, and, and it's actually true, if your focus is money, there's always a catastrophe bigger than your pile of cash. No matter how much you put aside for the rainy day and the stormy day and the blizzard day, I mean, there's always something bigger. And so we live, people that are caught up in the spirit of man, they live with that fear. I'll never have enough, so I've got to get what's mine. I've got to get all I can. Can all I get, sit on the can. <laughs> Make sure it's mine, you know, I've got to protect what I got. And it's, it's this attitude that hurts people. There's a book that was written, The Day America Told the Truth by James Patterson and Peter Kim. Interesting, they interviewed thousands of people, surveyed them, Americans, and said, what would you be willing to do for $10 million? What would you be willing to do? And here's what they said. 25% said 
they'd be willing to abandon their family. See ya. Don't want to be ya. You know, they'll, they'll abandon it. It's like the lady who won the lottery, you know, 17 million. She calls up her boyfriend and says, hey, I won the lottery. Pack your bags. He goes, where are we going? Warm, wa warm weather, cold weather? She goes, I don't really care where you go as long as you're not here when I get home. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> Sometimes it happens that way, though. People, 25% are willing to say, you're gone. If, that's, if they thought they could get $10 23% million. said they would be willing to become a prostitute for a week or more. Hello. 16% said they would give up their American citizenship. That's not too surprising nowadays, right? You hear about that? People are so upset. Going to Canada. 10% would withhold testimony letting a murderer go free. 7% would kill a complete stranger. 3% would put their children up for adoption. <laughs> Some of you might be thinking, I'd do that for free, actually. <laughs> but, you know, all kidding aside, I mean, you read those. I, I, when I read them, I just, my heart ached. I thought, that's so sad. And that's, that's large groups of people. That's Americans. I mean, there's like this, this spirit over our nation, a spirit of mammon. Hey, if there's enough money involved, I'll, there's no, I'll stoop real low. That's the spirit of mammon, friends. That's what that is. And so that should be a concern for us. Mammon tries to influence us for, for, for you know, it, just, it causes us to focus on what money can provide in inordinate ways where we just think, oh, man, I just need this. I just need more money, more money. And we're influenced like that. Now, as I said, there is a, the spirit of mammon is a god. And it tries to offer us what only God can really provide. So I'm going to expose it today because they're lies. They're promises of mammon, but really they're just lies. Let's look at them. Number one is security. Mammon offers you, in fact, there's, there's actual financial trusts that are called securities, right? Mammon offers you that, that you will be secure. <clears throat> no matter how bad things get in the country, you'll be, you'll, and you see this in advertisements, you see this in commercials, that no matter how bad things get, if I have enough, I'll be secure. I'll be secure. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. Security comes from God. It doesn't come from a, the spirit of mammon. Amen. And so, but a lot of people buy into that. They, they buy into that. And there's Christians, people that love the Lord. They're going to heaven. That's, that's a non, they've got that locked, in, locked down. And they're also living a life that's godly in many ways, but still are being influenced by the spirit of mammon. You might be one of them. And so, if you're putting your security in money, and you're trying to always think, how am I going to be secure? How, and you're, and you're, there's a fear going connected to that. There's probably something operating in your life associated with this spirit of mammon or money. Proverbs eleven twenty eight says, whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Do you put your trust in policies from Washington, D.C., and the economies of men, or are you going to put your trust in the Lord? That's really what he's saying. Hebrews 13 says, keep your lives free from the love of money. <clears throat> he's talking about the spirit of mammon. And be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. <clears throat> and if you believe that, then your response is this. Now I can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid what can man do to me? Some of you need to read this verse every day. I mean, you're, you're, there's, you don't feel that way. You don't have the sense that he'll never forsake you, that you don't have to worry, that he'll, he'll, he'll protect you, he'll watch over you. And no matter, the truth is, no matter, if, you're, if you put your faith in Christ, you put your security in, find your security in him, no matter how bad a recession is or depression or correction or economic collapse, God's going to provide for you. He's going to protect you. You know, when there's the plagues in Egypt that came down, you know, the people in Goshen, those plagues didn't come on them. God protected them. Here's a great verse here. It's not on your outline, but it's on the, si on the slides. Psalm 37, 25. I was young, and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. See, 
God will protect you. That our security is in him. But the spirit of man, and there's a lie, it says, no, you can trust in money. Number two is identity. That's another lie that you, you'll be somebody. If you have enough money, you're, you're somebody special now. And, you're, and you're, the truth is, your net worth has nothing to do with your self-worth. You, your identity should be rooted in God. But what happens is, when, you're, when uh, you try to find your identity in, in money, you, you buy things you don't need with money you don't have to impress people you don't even like. And you end up living a life trying to impress people. Because what happens is money, that's an empty promise. And so as you get and collect and accumulate more and more, you have this, this affliction of the affluent. Where they, they, they were, they, it was an empty promise. So they try to buy lots of things and show off things. It's all about where they vacation and they, and they live a life trying to impress people, trying to say, do I really matter? Do, do you respect me more now because of my money? Because that's, that's what mammon told them would happen, that they would, they would have this identity. Jesus comes along and says, beware, don't be greedy for what you don't have. Real life is not measured by how much you own. <clears throat> Your identity has nothing to do with how much you have. Jim Carrey said, I read a quote this week. He said, that comedian and the actor, right? He said, uh, he goes, I think everybody should get rich and famous. That way they'll see it's not the answer. So many of us think that's the answer. If I just got wealthy, my ship has come in. Everything's good now. Well, that's not the way it is. The spirit of mammon would tell you that's the way it is. But it's not. Where is our identity? How? Wh- wh- where do we get our identity from? Well, from God. God says that you are, he goes, you are my workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to influence, to do good works on this planet that he's prepared in advance for you to do. That's what he says. He says you, you were created long before he even created the, the universe. You say, well, that's a long time ago. That is. But you were in God's mind. You were in God's mind. He's saying, I'm going to create you. Look at this verse. Long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. This past Friday was the National March for Life Day where we celebrate life. And I know it's very politicized, but here's the facts. God, in your mother's womb, God called you by name, had it, you were special. That's what it's about. It's just recognizing when does life start. And so if we just leave it up to scientists, then they'll fuse like they did this past week. They'll fuse a human with a pig. And there, I mean, there's no morals for scientists. There's no, there's no context for that. But for Christ followers, when we look at God's word, he says, no, actually, your life has value from way back when you, were just, when you started in your mother's womb and before, and before. Psalm 139 says, you were created... For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Not everybody knows that full well. Sometimes believers don't know that full well, so they look to the spirit of mammon to give them identity. One of the reasons we offer Vineyard 301 is we give you a a spiritual gift assessment. We talk to you about how God created you, how you can be used for making a difference in this world. And no matter how much money you have, well, let's do it together. Let's change the world for Jesus and see, and, and, and see what God does through, 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 through us. Third lie is happiness. Now, probably most of you know this. I mean, that there's, there's a plenty of wealthy people that are miserable, rich people that are miserable. That, it doesn't create happiness, although that is one of the promises that the spirit of mammon will make. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, those who love money, it's referring, this love of money is the spirit of mammon. In other words, it's okay to have money, it's just not okay for money to have you. He says, we'll never have enough. How absurd to think that wealth brings true happiness. Well, that's absurd, he says. Some people, they, they probably wouldn't verbalize it. It's like politically incorrect or something. They wouldn't say, yeah, money brings happiness. But they live like that's true. They spend like that's true. That is their life MO. Although they wouldn't say it because they know people would look at them like, that's absurd because it is. Well, where does happiness come from? Well, happiness comes from recognizing my sins are forgiven. That I, 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 I have a place in the kingdom of God because of what Christ did for me. 
that I have a clear conscience. Notice what he says, happy are those whose sins are forgiven. In other words, it's better to be just, instead of being debt-free, I'd rather be just guilt-free. Now, it's good to be debt-free, but it's way better to be debt-free of the soul, knowing that my, all my sins, past, present, and future, Christ paid for those, so I don't have to pay for them. I don't have to live with guilt. And I can live with the power and the freedom that comes from being able to forgive that is not afforded to people who, don't, who haven't been forgiven. It just, it just can't do it. You've got to be, you've got to personally experience the forgiveness of God before you can then give that out. And I'm able to do that like all Christ followers who have that experience. And that's, there's happiness that comes. You're released from all that bitterness, all that anger. Happy are those whose sins are forgiven whose wrongs are pardoned. Happy is the person whom the Lord does not consider guilty. That's awesome. You get a fresh start. Just a fresh, and this 2017 can be that for you, a fresh start, including your finances. Now, when it comes to the issue of finances, sometimes the church kind of falls on one extreme or the other. One extreme would be the prosperity gospel. You know, bring in the money, pass the bucket three times, and it's all about, you know, and I can have five Rolls Royces. No, you can't. That's not God's, that's not the gospel. That's an extreme. Like, it's all about me, and I get as much money as I want. That's, God's not honored in that. And then the other extreme is this, this idea that, oh, God wants me broke and poor and humble, and he receives that. He doesn't receive that. That's not his will. He wants you blessed. He wants you blessed. He wants your cup to overflow. You know, that's in Psalms 23. My cup overfloweth. What is he talking about? He's talking about it all. Your cup over. Why? Because you have enough to give away. You have enough to bless others. God blesses you so that you can be a blessing to others. That's why God, he wants you to use your resources to leverage him to influence other people for good. And to be blessed. I mean, you don't have to live on Beanie Weenie and Top Raymond, you know, this, you know, <laughs> cheese and, you know, mac and cheese and all. No, I'm not talking. God, you live in the blessing God gives you, but it's not all for you. You realize that that's a spirit of mammon. You realize, no, I want, I'm going to use, I, I have to be careful how I use this because I want to be a blessing to, to other people that God brings into my life. I want to make a difference. 1 Timothy 6 says, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires. That's the spirit of mammon he's talking about. That plunge men into ruin and destruction. 25% saying, I'll abandon my family. 23% said, I'd be a prostitute. All those kinds of things. For the love of money, the spirit of mammon, is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So we don't want to do that. So how do you get the spirit of of mammon off, the spirit of God's presence on your money. Because money's spiritual. How do you get that? Well, that's an important thing to know. And as you approach 2017, you want to be able to do that. You want to say, I want God's spirit on my money. Well, what you need to do, all of us, we need to recognize that our attitude has to change. <clears throat> we have to realize that it's all God's. Everything is God's. Everything that he created is, is his. And that he then proportions it out and gives. Everybody gets some, but everybody doesn't get the same amount. And then, well, then, we, and then we have to recognize it's God's, it's God's resources. And so God then says he wants us to return some to him. We don't, it's not giving. You can't give what you don't have. It's not yours. It's God's. That's why it starts with recognizing it's all the Lord's. And then we return some to him. We return. It's called a tithe. You, Andy, you're talking about tithing? Well, you must be building something. No, we're not building anything. This, this building's paid for. Yes, it's great. But you say, well, Andy, you're the preacher, though. I expect you to say that. Well, I get that. I understand. I can't argue with that. I get it. But I can tell you my own personal story that years before I knew I was, God was going to call me into the ministry, I came to Christ when I was 18, and I learned about tithing. At first, it bothered me. Probably like most of you. For me, I, I was living with the spirit of mammon in my life. So I didn't want anybody touching my stuff. But as I trusted God with my finances, I've seen that God has provided for me. We want 
the spirit of God, God's spirit on the finances of this church. Sharon and I started this church a little over 22 years ago. From the very first offering, we gave 10% away. We gave 10% to missions. We gave, gave 10%. We wanted God's presence on it. And now it's, way, it's, much, it's much more than 10%. We look for ways that we can give away. When we were going to renovate this facility, we moved here in this uh, racquetball facility at, se- at about seven and a half years into our church plant. And then at around year 10, we thought, well, we need to renovate this. This is going to cost a couple million dollars. And so before we started our capital campaign, we, I said, you know what? We're going to take up an offering, not for this church, but for another community that has no church. We're going to plant a church in Mexico. And so we raised $65,000. That was enough money to build a whole building. And that they, they, could, they were able to gather and they're growing. And that's our missions team is down there currently. They're down there right now. They're ministering in, in, in Mazalam. One of the places is the, in Stone Island where we built that church. Here's a picture of the church. A young gal in front of it. Uh, it's actually a lot bigger than that. That's just the doorway. I just pulled these down from, from, from Facebook yesterday. And then the next picture is they were doing medical stuff, uh, it, helping the kids, helping the adults. And then we also give them shoes. That's what's in those bags. That little kid, the, he's, this little girl next. Now look at that face. I'm telling you, these kids, I've been there a number of times. We walk through the Colonials, invite them to get shoes. They're living in houses that are made of like sticks with a tin, something like some kind of piece of metal on top. Abject poverty. And we're influencing them with, with we want God's spirit on the, the, the finances of this church. So we return to God. We return a portion of that to him. And you say, well, Andy, you know, again, I mean, you're just, you have a vested interest in this. Well, let me, let me just tell you, we have a number of tithers in this church. I encourage you, go find one. Go up to somebody and say, hey, are you a tither? And you ask them their story. Find somebody who doesn't work for the church and ask them their story. They'll tell you. I've talked to, I know most of them, if not all of them. And they'll tell you, hey, I'm not rich, but God has been faithful. He's kept the, the, because one of the promises is when we return to God his, he says that he'll keep the, uh, the locust and the worm from devouring, the devourer from, from devouring our finances. He says God's been faithful in that, kept the devourer at bay. And sometimes God opens up the windows of heaven and pours out an offering, uh, pours out, you know, some kind of blessing that I can't even able to handle it. I mean, they'll just tell you about God's faithfulness. They're not going to say, no, I wouldn't recommend that. I've been tithing for years. It doesn't work. I, I, I don't know anybody like that. Go find somebody. You go talk to them yourself. But God says, you return to me. So here's the question. You return. Am I returning the first? Am I returning the first? So we return, but also the first, because more than the amount is the priority. God, you're first place in my life. That's why he talks about giving him first. Proverbs 3 says, honor the Lord with your wealth. In other words, that just demonstrates that you're, that you're my helper, that you're my provider, not anyone else, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Here's another verse, Deuteronomy 14. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. And so putting God first, Giving the tenth, say tenth is, I'm going to return that to you, 10% of my income. And then what happens to the other 90%? Just whatever we want. No, actually, that's God's too. But he gives that to you. He says, I want you to steward or manage that well. So that's the next question. Is, am I stewarding the rest? The rest of that, the 90%, what am I doing with it? What's well, important what I do with it? Again, God blesses us so we can be blessed but we're supposed to be a blessing to others, leveraging our resources to impact other people. How we handle it is very important. Luke 16 says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, that's the spirit of the the money with the spirit of mammon on it, who will trust you with true riches? In other words, if you, don't make, if you don't say, God, I want your presence on it. I don't want your spirit on it. And then I'm going to use it to influence others. Because that's what true riches are. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who would give you property of your own? And so how we manage that is very important. What we do with that. That's why we offer Financial Peace University. It started last week. 
Wednesday night, it meets here in the auditorium. Some of you need to be part of that. Financial Peace University, you can find out more about it as you walk out on the right. Just talk to them at the, connect, at the uh, information table, and they'll tell, you, they'll tell you about it. But Financial Peace, to kind of get things in order. How do I make everything happen? How do I, how do I make this work so that I can be a good steward of it? Because God says, just like you would, if you were an employer and you had five or ten employees and you gave them each a certain amount of money, you would watch how they manage that. So if you had more money to give, you'd give it to the ones that manage it well, right? Well, God does the same thing. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who's going to give you more? Why would God give you more and trust you with more? And then he says, he talks about true riches. True riches is the only thing that's going to last and do eternity is people. And money, you can't take your money with you. And so we use our money and we leverage it to impact people for eternity's sake. So if God's given you a swimming pool, you use your swimming pool and have kids in the neighborhood come over, play with your kids, and you tell them about the gospel. Or Super Bowl, if you have a big screen TV, you know somebody who doesn't have one, you invite them over. Hey, we're watching the Super Bowl. And then you're able to just indirectly maybe share a little bit about the gospel in between, you know, I don't know when. The commercials are kind of cool. You'd find, you'd find a way, right? <laughs> find a way to talk about Jesus. And you, you realize that true riches or what's going on into heaven, which is people. Am I focusing, number three, am I focusing on true riches? In other words, am I really making a difference? God gave us resources for a purpose. We get our perspective right. Matthew 6, this is the last verse, and then we'll close. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's okay to have stuff. It is. It's okay to enjoy life and enjoy the blessings God gives you. But how we manage that, we want to make sure and leverage what God has given us to make a difference for eternity. Let's bow our heads and pray. We're just going to take a few moments here, just a couple minutes, two or three minutes. I'm going to ask you to be quiet, not to try to gather your things right now. Just to take a moment, and this is really between you and God now, because we just had a Bible study. We had some singing, and we had a Bible study, but prayer, whenever we're finished in reading the Bible, it's decision time. Will we do what God is asking us to do? And that decision falls square in your lap, right where you're at, right where you're seated. It's between you and God right now. It's your moment to pray. Some of you have been gripped with the spirit of mammon. And so there's that influencer that's saying, no, 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 that's true. Don't believe that. And then if you, if you incline your ear to the Holy Spirit, you'll hear a different voice. It says, trust in the Lord with all your strength. Lean not unto your understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your paths. The Holy Spirit will say, no, you can trust what I'm saying to you. And so it's decision time. I want you to make a decision. Am I going to, what am I going to do? It's the beginning of 2017. Am I going to recognize that I want my body is a, is a temple, is a sanctuary. God's given me a new faith that money is spiritual and that I, God wants to bless me, but he wants to bless money that's been dedicated to him, not worldly mammon, not worldly wealth. Would you say, God, I want to serve you in all ways. Today is my time to decide. And so I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to make a decision right now. So if that's you, I want you to decide in advance. I'm going to pray with you right now to, to put your faith in Christ. Maybe you've been away from the Lord. Maybe you were raised in the church. And you're, you're saying, you know what? Truth be known, I'm not really that close to God. God says, come on home. He's not angry with you. He loves you. He, wants you. he invites you back into his presence. He wants to bless you. 
He wants to have that, that relationship with you. So decide right now, am I going to be one of those ones? I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm not going to have you do that kind of stuff. I'm just going to pray with you right where you're at. But you need to decide in advance. Okay, I'm going to pray with you now. You say, God, forgive me. Just whisper it. Pray it under your breath. God, forgive me for trying to do life my own way. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Breathe a brand new spirit in me. If you're falling away, just say, God, renew my faith. Renew that love. Then when you say, God, I want to put you first in my life. I want to put you first spiritually, physically, financially, socially, in every way. I want you to control my life. I'm not going to do it on my own anymore. Now I'm going to pray for everybody. Lord, I would pray that as a church, we would declare we're, not, we're going to use unrighteous mammon, worldly wealth, to do your work. We want your blessing on that. We're not going to seek our identity through what the world has to offer. You say that you'll never leave us or forsake us. You say that you are our helper and that we don't have to be afraid. We're not going to look for security. We're not going to look for happiness from money. We're going to find it in you. Lord, thank you for the honor and the privilege of being the gospel to our community and the people that we love and care about, people we work with, people that we don't love and care about. Everybody that irritates us, we get the privilege of, of being lovers in the world. People that have, through the power of Christ, the ability to bring a word that can release people captive, who are captive, release people that are addicted, people that have all kinds of things going on, relational brokenness in their homes. Lord, we pray that use us this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vmchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.